Can you summarize season one for me? Season one was a 360 minute description of the state of baseball in the the best way that I could explain it through myself being connected on some level to the sport as far back as I can remember. And I didn't like where I saw things going on the professional ranks. And I basically started creating a list of if I had a show, what would I want to talk about? What points would I want to make that seem relevant, which could point out why I thought the sport was heading the wrong direction. And I whittled it down to the topics that seemed the most important. And then that ended up being in 360 minutes of me talking about those things. And that was season one. So, yeah, I listened to, I think I was one of the first people to finish all nine episodes. And the reason why I consumed it so quickly was because I think I even called you a few times, say, hey, when's, when's the next episode coming out? And uh, because it just, it spoke to me. And as a former baseball player, you know, when I was a kid and lover of baseball, you were articulating things that were in my heart that I had never really thought that much about. And I had just kind of put baseball, like you say, on a shelf and I hadn't looked at it for a while. And you reminded me not just why I'm frustrated with, with baseball, but why I love it too. That's a incredible compliment to be able to pull out an emotion that you had buried that you didn't even know you'd buried. And I think a lot of people are dealing with that because we're just being force fed this certain type of baseball that it doesn't really correlate with the same sport as how we grew up with it. And it, it's hard to know exactly where that comes from, but something's not right. That part has felt obvious to me for, for quite a while. And it was really, really, it still is disappointing, but what's so weird about it is it's deeply disappointing, but that's only when I really bear down and, and study those feelings. Otherwise it's just thrown to the wayside as something that's not as important as, you know, the million other things that are going on in life. But if I'm forced to sit down and think about and talk about how I feel about it, it's this like beast gets unleashed in terms of, uh, just the whole thing, the whole thing, the whole thing is so fucked to me that I knew I needed 360 minutes to get out even close to what I was thinking. And I feel like I did that. You kind of warned me about a lot of things I didn't know about banning the shift. I was like, what? How do you, how do you ban the shift? How you're going to tell players where to play? I had the pleasure of being with my dad this last week. And when I mentioned that banning the shift, he started shaking his head and saying, God, I wish I knew exactly what he said, but something to the tune of, is that not the biggest joke ever? Yeah. The, you know, I, I didn't really even realize that this was a rule until I said it on one of the episodes, but you can have the nine players play wherever you, wherever you want as a manager. But you have to have a pitcher and a catcher. Yeah, exactly. I never really, really actually thought about it, but yeah. it, it naturally came out that way. And I can't think of any better way to keep the game interesting than that statement. You must have a pitcher and catcher. Play, them where, play the other seven wherever you feel is best. The thing that I hate about banning the shift is it takes so much brain out of the game. It's like, oh... No, just teach the kid to hit it really hard in one direction, and that's all he needs to do as a hitter. He doesn't have to read the defense. He doesn't have to learn back control. Just just learn to hit home runs, Johnny. That's all you need to do. Pull the ball. Yeah, I don't like that a kid would even have to think of that or know what the shift is. So what other people say is they're like, that should have been a base hit. It's like, no, it shouldn't have been. 
he always hits it to the same spot. So they put a guy there. <laughs> he can't. He needs to learn how to put the ball in different places. It's not, it should not be a hit. Yeah, uh, that's just bad announcing. If everyone says it, everyone says, "Oh well, it should be a hit." Well, that just makes me think that they're, you know, in on it, so to speak. That somebody wants that to be nipped in the bud, and. You know, you never know if this stuff's true or not, but when you start to feel that there's a bigger body trying to get a narrative out there, I mean, I guess it's just another microcosm of the world we live in is that's everywhere and baseball is not immune to it is I think we we all want and this goes back to the Black Sox scandal and probably you know, further back than that, and actually definitely further back than that, because in the early 1900s, it was gambling was this major, major concern that the people just wanted the pure sport and to be able to watch, but people started throwing games for money. And what would test the beauty and the purity more in the art form of baseball than the best players not playing their best? Throwing, where do we start with this? What was I even saying? Yeah, just talking about baseball. Just talking baseball. We're talking about banning the shift and uh, banning the shift somehow. The, we're talking about integrity. It. Like, let's talk about integrity. You know, I, we saw a recent just demonstration of a lack of integrity from MLB, and I think you know, it's really oh, yeah? it's really sad that that's something that's kind of the story in baseball right now. So, what's the lack of integrity that you're talking about? Yeah, negotiating in bad faith. Negotiating in bad faith. So what does that mean to you? It means um, you lock the players out. You say it's because you want to get the deal rolling, but then you don't call them for 40 days. Then you do a few meetings. Then all of a sudden you're meeting every day at the end of the week. And then you kind of lie about how much progress is made. You give them a poison pill. You slip in a few things at the end okay. of the day. Yeah. And you kind of, then you, you say, oh, we, we were so close, but the player said no. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. That's that's negotiating in bad faith. That's that there's a sincere lack of integrity there. Yeah, I don't get the feeling that the players or the owners or anyone else that's involved really care about the sport at all in terms of its own they're taking the sport so for granted that it will always be more popular, always make more money, always be the national pastime. Always 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 even though they're the ones dismantling it. I mean, think about think about this. Every player that's in the big leagues today, compare them to all the players that have played the big leagues in the past. So it's hundreds of people today up against thousands and thousands and thousands of big leaguers. Okay. It's on their watch. When this shit hits the fan. And I don't think they're taking that serious at all. And I don't know how serious I could take it when dollar signs were flashing in front of my eyes like sugar plums at Christmas sort of thing. But they're all going to get caught up in it and it's going to be on their watch. And that'll mean whatever it means in the future. It That might mean, you know... Little Johnny going up to his granddad. Did you play Major League Baseball? Oh, that's right. Yep, I played in from 2015 to 2029 for the Reds. Oh, so you guys went designated hitter. Can we talk about something else? <laughs> so whatever it means that it's on their watch, I don't know how serious that is. I just know it's a fact. Yeah. Just like, you know, Bud Selig's tie all-star game is on his watch. And, what, what could he do? And he can defend it. And people like me can tell him he's a fool for letting it go that route. But the fact remains, it's on his watch. The, the worst moment in sports history. I think so. Do you want to know what I think the worst moment in sports history is? Sure. The 94 strike. Mm. Yeah, I uh I stopped being a baseball fan for a good long time. I boy, <clears throat> I was 162 on the radio, on TV, you know. 
uh, kind of guy, kind of kid. I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Couldn't be a bigger fan. Love baseball. You know, that's interesting timing for me because I was going into freshman year of high school and entered a school that was known for their baseball program and knew I was going to be a part of it. And my freshman year, October, no World Series. That's that's pretty wild. It seems like things keep popping up that signify timing or the importance of timing. And I'd never thought about that one when that sort of started. But that was my, you know, that was my demise in baseball was, you know, entering the high school ranks. I'd been a good player at all the levels and then just really got uh, ignored by this baseball program. And by senior year, I'd started playing golf instead of baseball. Never could have thought anything could take me away from the sport of baseball, but nothing like getting sat squarely on the bench and having to watch someone play in front of you that you don't think's better. I know how that feels. That's a stinker. And, you know, you can lend that to anything. You know, you can oh, yeah. lend that over to my uh, my vice president boss is actually a moron and I could be running this company better than him. Right. Or her. Right. Or they. <laughs> or they, <laughs> For sure. You talk about chess in season one. The reason chess comes up is because it's just such an easy puzzle piece, if you will, that represents perfection. And chess gets described as perfect. Baseball gets described as perfect. And the easiest correlation I can make between chess and baseball is if you change one thing about it, then... The history, in some sense, I think more so in chess, but the history gets wiped out. And who knows how many grandmasters there's been or whatever whatever it is they call them. But if you start tweaking things, it's a different game. And baseball is tweaking things like crazy. And when, I mean, feel the ripple effect from implementing the designated hitter. Through those almost 50 years, it would have been unthinkable to play a different way in Little League in the 60s. You just play baseball. There's nothing confusing about it. You just play baseball on whatever field you have. And if your fence is 100 feet or 600 feet, if it goes over the fence, it's a home run. But the ripple effect, I don't know when it started, but leagues underneath the big leagues at some point started using designated hitters. And from what I've been hearing, almost every league plays that way. And so children or people that are of an older age won't be taught to play both ways. I think that's a massive, massive mistake. And there will be a consequence. Well, we've already heard a, a story about consequences in the Colorado kid. <laughs> oh, the Colorado kid. Yeah, it's funny. It, the two people that I realized I brought in to my stories that I described what type of people they were. One was extremely large round wise, and the other was extremely large the other way. And uh, they were that. It probably sounds like I'm storytelling, but. Nick was a 300 plus pounder and the other guy, I can't remember his name, but he was at the very, if I had to bet my life on it and he said, if you underbid his size, but get as close as possible, there's no chance he's shorter than six, six. I think he's six, eight, six, nine, but thick, not a skinny guy. And definitely the type of guy that you'd believe could throw hard and uh, evidently couldn't bat hard though. So uh, he's just a pitcher. Just a pitcher. Yeah, just a pitcher. Not, just, a, not a baseball player. Not, yes. Thank you for saying that. Not a baseball player, but a pitcher. Pitchers are not supposed to hit. Nothing sounds more stupid to me. Well, I was a pitcher who hit. Yeah. Yeah. I was also a pitcher that could hit. And so remember when, I, I don't remember who the pitcher was, but I 
oh, I think he played for the Diamondbacks a few years ago. And he'd said he'd gotten hurt batting or running or whatever it was. And he was uh, using that opportunity to say how it's silly or stupid that pitchers have to hit. And Madison Bumgarner felt like it might be worth uh, throwing in an um, opposing quote. Perfect because a division rival. And he said uh, something to the tune of, yeah, it doesn't really seem to bother me too much. <laughs> and just leave the quote short. Let let other people sift through it and make their own conclusions. But something I think that's so interesting about a guy like Madison Bumgarner or any other pitcher that is thought of as a better hitter than maybe his uh, contemporaries, if you are going to take batting your pitcher out of the game, you are punishing the best hitting pitchers because they are the ones that are the most well-rounded and they are the ones that are helping themselves be better pitchers through their offense. So I think the thing you're doing the most is you're bringing more offense into a game that has all the offense that it needs. You don't need a second baseman to have 20 or 30 home runs if they're an excellent baseball player. However, if you have a Ryan Sandberg type that is an excellent second baseman and hits 40 home runs, that is best case scenario. Hey, he's got a good glove. He's won gold gloves, I believe. And he's also slugging now. So you're covering both sides. Was Ozzie Smith a great hitter? Traditionally, not really. He did end a World Series game with a home run. But traditionally, he was not a big bat. But do you want to take Ozzy Smith out of your lineup and put someone else at shortstop in? Cardinals didn't. And he made the big leagues on the merit of his glove was so good that he got to stay in the lineup. If someone was as good a defender as Ozzy was on the Cardinals and had a bigger bat, they'd have put him in. He would have earned the job over Ozzy. But you take a guy like Madison Bumgarner, you know, the performance he gave against the Royals in the World Series, you know, abused word, but it was epic. It was completely epic what he did. And he stayed on the mound and he was always a threat to hit, giving him an advantage over the Royals players. Although, oh, isn't this interesting? I think game seven was in Kansas City. So he wouldn't have been batting. I don't believe the Giants batted uh, Madison during the World Series games. I think you can, though. I don't think there's a rule that says you can. Yeah, they could have. Like, you can, as far as you know, you can... Shohei Otani. Okay, so he's already doing it. So I'd want to see an Angels lineup card. I'm interested about that. <laughs> we were talking about the uh, the negotiations, right? And, you know, the players want what the players want. And mm-hmm. the owners want money. As much money as possible. And hmm. I believe you know you can say pox on both their houses, but but I think a lot of people miss miss something about the players, and that is that the average baseball player is not anywhere close to being a millionaire. They sacrifice, they sacrifice, they get hurt, and they're broke. Mm-hmm. That's the average baseball player. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that has to do with baseball having a bunch of weird rules about contracts and the players are trying to move the needle on that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, (laughs) I mean, you put that up against a, you know, we just want more, a bigger slice of the pie. Like, I don't know how you, I don't know how, if you're, if you're following what's going on right now, if you're not with the players, I don't think you're paying attention. Yeah. I mean, I'm always going to side naturally more with the players because I don't know what it would feel like to be a billionaire, but it's hard to imagine feeling like you'd need more money once you're a billionaire. And I'm sure only billionaires could understand that. And it seems like, I guess it's, it just goes so against what capitalism in America stands for is make as much as you want. And, you're kind of encouraged to do that. But also at the same time, you never stop being a person. And so, you know, society appreciates people as a whole that look out for their fellow 
person or man or, you know, that's a rewarded thing. But I mean, how are we even set up at all to kind of embrace businesses that actually are doing good things? You know, you have the, I had a piece of chocolate yesterday and it said, there's something at the bottom that said, we put 10% of our profits towards the planet. And I thought, that's a huge number if you're running a business. That's a gargantuan number. But I'd never heard of that chocolate company. And is that chocolate company being lauded for giving the 10%? It's like, well, does it taste good? It's like, it's like we really just want the good product in our businesses. And we don't really, th th we don't have a system to celebrate who the best businesses are. It's the only real celebrating is like, oh, Apple came out with their earnings, record earnings. And you go, yeah, they do make nice phones. We almost, we would want them to have good earnings so that they keep making good products. But how often do you hear about, you know, what is Apple doing for their employees or the world or the, the earth or any of that? And I have no idea because I've never heard it talked about. Yet Apple represents deep wealth deep, deep wealth in the current business model. And yet all that's really talked about with them is what's their earnings and uh, how good are their phones working. And so there's not really a scale to, you know, I, I what you just said about baseball, I've never looked into whatsoever in terms of what's going on with uh, negotiations. And, you know, if if you're not with the players, you're not paying attention I'm I'm not paying attention because it hurts my stomach to even dive into it because I know that these negotiations will will take away things in the game of baseball that I don't want to go away. They've already negotiated away the DH it seems like. I mean there is no deal, but right. The concession was ma made by the players for the DH. Um mm. at the, at the one of the things, you know, when we were talking about the owners negotiating in bad faith, they kind of slipped in the pitch clock right at the end in their final offer. Wait, that was before or that was this year? This is just the other day. So they slipped it in as a, as a poison pill at the last minute. Uh, okay. Who slipped it in? Owners or players? The owners. Oh, the players don't want that. The owners want that. It gets confusing. The players want the DH. The owners okay, didn't want the DH. You've said that twice now. Let me interrupt you. Yeah. The players don't want the DH. This is what it means when you say the players want the DH. You're implying every player wants the DH. Oh, I'm, I'm not trying to imply. I'm implying that you collectively, <laughs> collectively, <laughs> collectively, they have been arguing with yeah, Major yeah. League Baseball. That's one of their things that they want. I understand that. But let's get this clear. If the players are going to have any chance of getting more money, they have to be stand in solidarity together. And so if you are a player and you think baseball should be played the way that baseball is played and pitchers bat. You can't raise your voice and say that you have to, you're either with us or against us. So if you want to keep making your money that you make as a big league baseball player, you are for the DH, whether in your heart you want it or not. And how many people have built their way up from the bottom, little league gone all the way up, dominated high school, Dominated college, made it to the minors, got through AAA, made it to the big leagues. How many people would really take a stand and say, I won't play baseball unless the pitchers hit? What percentage? Zero. Probably zero. But how many of those people in their heart wish it would kind of stay the same, but I have to feed my family? A lot of them. So that's a very understandable position to be in. But that doesn't mean to me that the players are for it, yeah. in air quotes. It's kind of being forced. Because it's a bargaining chip. They can just say, we'll do this if you give us this. So who loses the game? Because you're drawing it away from its original perfection. It's just getting Mona Lisa's eyebrows just a little, little bit cleaner. Just a little more updated. Although, you know, 
DH would not represent the Mona Lisa's eyebrows or eyelashes. This would be more like, you know, nose job, territory. Yeah. Lips. Very big lips. Right. The surgically inflated lips. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think Very the DH would. Look. Yeah. I think the DH would represent something more uh, face changing. So I love a good analogy, and I love that analogy of the Mona Lisa, and you've made it the name of your show. Mm -hmm. And I I like it a lot, but I've got another one. Okay, baseball. A, a new name for my show? No, no, oh, we're not okay. going to change, change the name of the show. Okay, I like the name of the show. We already made the logo. <laughs> baseball is like the Hope Diamond. It's uh, refresh me on what the Hope Diamond is. It's the it's a huge diamond. Okay. That's what I was It's like the biggest in... It, it, it's a... People... It comes to town. People come... They come look at it. Okay. Where is it? I don't know right now. It's on tour. <laughs> but the idea here is that this diamond is revered because it's so large. And if you were to look at it and go, oh, I can make that better. I can cut it. And, you know, you'd have to... You'd have to cut it down. Mm. You'd have to cut mass off of it. It would no longer be as big. Mm -hmm. And you can look at this diamond from the perspective of it's perfect. I can fix it. But you can't fix it without taking things away from it. And yes. diamonds like this that are this large have little internal flaws. You can look at that flaw and say, I want to fix that flaw. Or you can embrace it. Because with that diamond, you can't fix that flaw without cracking the thing in half it's mm -hmm. un it's part of the diamond mm -hmm. i think that's beautiful i'm gonna have to work it around in my noodle for a while to really examine what it is you're saying but off the top i think that's great so talking about chess um mm, back to chess chess is really 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 baseball's really old and that's one of the reasons why you and I both believe that the rules shouldn't be changing like crazy, mm -hmm. um, especially some of the, anyway. Yeah, no, let's let's go right there because if something really needs to be changed, really needs to be changed, I'm open. So baseball, uh, how old do you, would you say baseball is? So it's probably hundred. 160, 180. Supposedly it came from other games. Other yeah. games. Yeah. So really, really old. But the thing is, let's say, let's take the Hope Diamond. It's like there's something in it that you go, oh, I don't like that very much. But you go, well, too bad you're stuck with it because this is the Hope Diamond. That's how it goes. Bringing a designated hitter in to boost attendance, to hope that it boosts attendance, the game was not ruined. There was nothing that you could say this has to change or else. I think if you're going to change a rule, you have to be on that line of this is going to be the end. If we don't do something and fix it. A lot of experts talk about baseball's ebbs and flows. They're not worried about it. This goes further back, but I'm never worried about baseball. If it's on a down, it'll come back up. There's always going to be things that bring it back up and there's going to be things that might bring it back down. But we have nothing to worry about because it's it's so self-correcting and all that stuff. But I don't think you can make a reasonable argument in 1972-73 saying, if we don't bring more offense into this game, it, the whole thing's going down. If they would have said that at the time, I don't think anyone would have believed them. Because I talked to a guy who said he wants to write a book about the 1960s, and he called it the golden age. The golden age of baseball. And he's a baseball guy. So if that's true, whatever happened in 1970, 71, and 72, could it have been so bad that baseball was threatened, that the Titanic's now sinking? I don't think you can make that case at all coming off the golden age. But yet, it got changed. And why did it get changed? Because it seemed like a good way to bring more people to the stadium. Is that a good enough reason to change something? I don't think it is. But I think the older something is, the more it ought to be respected in terms of keeping it in its entirety. 
and you know take anything that's old that's human built um you know golden gate over 100 years old or i think we're getting close to 100 years old you know there's been talk of changing colors it's like it's lunacy you know anything go further back sistine chapel and things like that what's going to make the sistine chapel the best is it going to be updating it or is it keeping it how it might have looked while michelangelo was painting it I think you don't even have to answer because it's so obvious. Why do you think they tore down Yankee Stadium and built a new one to resemble Yankee Stadium? Because there was something really special about it. But if you tear something down and build it across the street, it's not the same thing. And have you ever heard anyone say, Oh, the new Yankee Stadium is better than the old one. I've never heard that. Well, we were on the wrong coast. Definitely on the wrong. I mean, coast. let me let me flip that. Have you ever heard anyone say, "Let's talk about Candlestick versus Oracle"? Okay. Three com. It has a new three name. com. No, three com was Candlestick for a minute. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I wasn't a big fan of that one. Monster Park. That was another one. Yeah, that was real. It'll always be Candlestick. And I still think of it as Pac Bell. I do too. So Pac Bell versus Candlestick. Yeah, yeah, let's just fuck go you, with Oracle. That. Sorry. Yeah, Candlestick and Pac Bell. Let's talk. Um, so I hated Candlestick. <laughs> candlestick sucked. The new park is infinitely fucking better. Just okay. so much better. Okay. I accept that stance. Now they I know you talked about in the first season about how it's changed. And I don't like those changes either. The change of Pac Bell? Yeah, the yeah, Nets. Yeah. And that's the new name. <laughs> and um, although, you know, you, you mentioned that the seats out in that, you know, where you had that triples alley mm-hmm. and they put seats there. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm trying to remember what you were speculating, why they were there. You were like, well, they put them there to increase offense. I think that was part of it, but they yeah. also. Moved- no, yeah, that's not why they put them there. And you also, because of the, they moved the. They move the bullpens. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, we'll get to that. Okay. I promise. Okay. I promise you we'll get to that. Okay. But I got to tell you, uh, it was just to have more seats. Because that used to come to a right angle. There were no good seats over in that area. Now you have like all these God. really great seats right there. I mean, that's one of those things where I I just believe you at face value. I don't. It's. Why is it even worth looking into for me? It's of course that's the reason. I never really thought of it that way. But also more hormones. <laughs> Actually, no, it's hitting it that deep. It's still pretty deep out it's, there. Yeah. I mean, Barry did it consistently, and well, that's ba- about Barry it. Bonds was not a human being. We'll get to that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Barry Bonds was so good that Richard really hit 37 home runs hitting in front of him one year. Yeah. That's how good Barry Bonds was. Yes. Yeah, that's I think that just speaks perfectly to Either Rich had a career year or Rich was juicing. Well, I you mean, look at Rich's stats when he's not hitting in front of Barry, they're a little different. Oh, interesting. Because I mean, wasn't he always though? Wasn't he always hitting second? Well, the idea is you you pitch to him because you don't want to pitch to Barry. Sure. So there's so many times where he's sure. he there's two outs and he's up. But I bet a pretty penny that Rich never hit 30 home runs any other year. And I'd bet a pretty penny he only hit over twenty home runs. The other I don't know if ever if he ever did. Yeah, I I wish I had the back of his baseball card right now. But oh yeah, can we talk about baseball cards? I have a solution to the steroid problem. Great, print Let's hear it. the guy's hat size <laughs> per year on the on, with his stat That's sheet. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's all I need. And then you can you can do your own metrics now. Just divide by hat size. No, but you have to compare. You have to prove that it's grown. You have to get head size at, you know. Yeah, no, for each year. I want the head size. Oh, for each year. Yeah. Okay. I was yeah. going to say you could start with like, you could get the the DMV to put on their driver's license yeah, yeah. at 16. Yeah, you, know, you yeah. get a baseball car. You, 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 yeah. You get, get the stats. Those, yeah, the stats. You know, I went looking for, speaking of Madison Bumgarner, I went looking for his offensive stats and I it was really difficult to find them. It was really, really, really hard to find like offensive stats for a pitcher. I had to, you know, go through all kinds of searches to find it yeah that could i can never explain how much that bothers me but all that tells me is that powers that be they don't care they don't want you to know that because (laughs) 
they don't. It's not important. It's not important because it, actually more important, they'd rather just have you forget about it. Right. And tell you how good the sport is, how healthy it is right now, how exciting it is, how it's quicker, and on and on about how it's better. And as good a year as Rich Aurelia had hitting in front of Barry Bonds that year, I think Madison Bumgar had more home runs per plate appearances. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So speaking of the bum, yeah, he's a stud. Yeah, I mean, when he takes the mound... And he's a better hitter than his opposing pitcher. He has that advantage. Now it's only him as a pitcher. Yeah. And so it's going to take a guy like Shohei to be able to bat or else nothing. You have to be that good. You have to be, I'm not going to say you have to be an MVP, (laughs) but you're going to have to be better than the DH that is taking up a roster spot. And that's going to be really rare. Can we talk about the real reason why the pitcher has to hit? The real reason. I mean... This is according to me? No. Well, you'll you'll, you'll agree with me, I think. Okay. Yeah, you tell me. The Yankees and the Rays have been throwing at each other for years now. <laughs> and I, I hate that it. brand of baseball. <laughs> It is such it is such a bad example to kids. But, I don't want to yeah. watch it. I don't think it's entertaining. I yeah. think it's stupid. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, people I... say, oh, oh, uh, he, oh, he he plunked him. It's like you're calling it. Oh, you you plunked him. That's attempted murder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, this is this is gold. I love this. Okay, let me counter that. So I know a guy who. He claimed, and this not a not a bragging type of guy. He was just telling me his recollections of being in Little League and throwing at guys because he knew it would scare them and it would give him an advantage as a pitcher. Okay, that is a, that is something that has been part of baseball. You go all the way back. A scary pitcher is. I went up against plenty of them, and I hated it every time, and I loved hitting about more than anything. But going up against a scary pitcher just plain sucks. Getting plunked is probably as awful or worse as you think it is, in case you've never been plunked. Uh, Not you, but, you know, anyone else. But that is an actual baseball strategy. And also part of being a baseball player, one of the reasons why – I had real limitations in my game is I wasn't tough enough. I don't like pain. I was really good at throwing, catching, hitting decently fast. Probably got picked off too much. But being tough really helps you in the sport. And there's something there's something that fans at least fans of the past, they gravitate towards somebody that's it's it's like that that humanity where they're just like me, except he's got blood on his uniform. And he's he can take how can he get plunked in the rib cage and not make a face? I would crumble on the ground. I couldn't do that. But big leaguers can, and to me there's something interesting about it, but I think the problem with what you're saying, Rays and Yankees throwing at each other, is it's not it's not based in a mono a mono thing. It's this it just would have a tendency to take care of itself if the pitcher had to bat. That's why the pitcher has to bat. I mean, there's nothing the reason why the Rays and the Yankees throw at each other for years is because the pitcher doesn't bat. And the reason why that doesn't happen in the National League, it it happens, but it doesn't happen for very long. It goes on for maybe a day, maybe a week, maybe maybe longer, but those things tend tend to get settled in the NL. And in the AL, it's just like a fire that just burns forever. Yeah, and and I guess that's why you kind of froze me up, because I don't pay attention to the American League. And so that brand of baseball, I haven't really been able to even think of it as good or bad. Because 
I, I almost just gloss it aside. Can I get this on the record? American League Baseball is not baseball. That, you, you said it. That's I'm repeating it. on the record, it. yes. And so now, if all these rumors are true, that we're done with pitchers hitting, DH only, we're going to have to call baseball... We can't really call it American League Baseball anymore because now National League is playing American League Baseball, but now they're the same. So it wouldn't American League Baseball wouldn't really hold up anymore hmm. because this is part of that whole. They're going to need to unify the leagues. Whatever, Why? Whatever that means. Why? I, I don't know, but they have. Supposedly, people say they have to. So you know that's going to happen, but I. I hesitate to call it American League Baseball because that won't represent what it does now when I say it or previously when I said it. So you and I have a really strong point of view when it comes to the DH, but I would like to make the case for why some players want it. And I'm going to make the case like this. In the minor leagues, if you're a pitcher, you do not hit. They don't. You don't take BP. Uh, you don't practice that. And even in layers layers below that, I mean, they're doing this in, in college all over the place. And so, Excuse me, I need to throw up. No, go ahead. I know, it's sickening. And so what you have are these pitchers who don't know how they're afraid to bat. <clears throat> A lot of them. Not, I mean, you, you have exceptions to that. And they're like, well, why do I have to bat in the NL? I don't hope I don't get called up to the NL. You know, and and they're the ones driving this. Well, they're part of the force driving. So there's also the there's also a group of like veteran players who are like, hey, if we have there's if there's more DHs in the league, then there's more players. There's more I hate room. that argument. Yeah, but that's but that's what it is. So I I want to get it out there so people understand like the full like both sides. Yeah, I'm tempted to just go with a no comment. <laughs> The pitcher has to hit. We both agree. Yeah. I mean, I think w what's so interesting about this is almost always this will work in terms of bringing in more offense. So if that's really what we need, that's going to work. However, the problem I have with it is you're taking out the potential for something that is the most exciting, that gets the fans the most riled up is exactly what you're saying. When a pitcher does something, you're never totally expecting it. a pitcher to do something great on offense. But when they do, you can't really access that excitement that it creates any other way in the sport. And so you're eliminating something that has the potential to, to really peak, to really hit that level that makes baseball that much more interesting as a well-rounded sport. And you pull out little things like that that have the ability to... Uh, really get the crowd to roar even more. I think that's very short-sighted and dangerous. And that's exactly what's happening. And I hear you talk about, you know, this is what the minor league pitchers want. And it's like, you can't, you can't stop a, a train. You can't stop a tidal wave. If everything's going that way, it's going to go that way. But I guess the point that I want to make, or the reason why it felt important for this to be, you know, really get talked about early in my episodes is that, the long run, it won't be better. You will lose sight of the fact that it was played a different way, and you might not be able to put your finger on it easy why baseball seemed better back in the day, but it's just one of the things that it's 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 going with its original creation. And as athletes progress... And as new exercises and regimens come into play through these athletes, you know, you look at old baseball cards and you go, that doesn't really look like an athlete. You look at today's, it's like, who's not yoked? You know, there's a few, they slip through the cracks, you know, but what a perfect way to tell the difference in history, knowing that they're playing by the same rules. I mean, that is the, that's the perfect way to compare eras and baseball nerds, Love comparing eras. What would have happened if so-and-so was playing when? And and everything that goes down that road and changing things around, it, it's just it's short-sighted and it's not playing the long game. And the reason why baseball should play the long game is it has the history going for it. And 
like I, the example I use with Sistine Chapel, it's the older it is, the more you should try to stick to the roots because that's what gives it its specialness, in my opinion. So baseball's old. Chess is really Yeah, old. how old is chess? Over a thousand years. Yeah. It, the thing is, and this is going to be my point, is that the further you go back, it diverges. It becomes unrecognizable. The rules of chess have changed very dramatically from the what archaeologists believe to be kind of the first version of chess. All right. And I won't go through the history. You were a journalist, caveman journalist back then. I won't go through the history of all the rule changes and how controversial I'm so they were. Curious. Yeah. <laughs> but it's I will I will <laughs> This is before the printing press even. And uh one of the rule changes that was introduced to chess was the queen. Ooh. The when? queen used to be the advisor and it was an underpowered piece when compared with the queen. The queen as you know is the most powerful piece in chess. Yeah. And is a recent addition introduced to make the game more exciting. Oh, that's great. This is gold. So when did the queen come into play? Uh, we'll look that up, but I, you know, it, oh, it, right. it, this is when you rich. take the history of the game, it's, yeah. it hasn't been for the majority of it. Right. So, so yeah, you're saying chess could be as old, is a thousand like a, um, it's over a thousand years old, over a thousand. Yeah. Um, Oh, another interesting thing is the representation of the pieces has changed. Like mm. uh, the fact that the elephant is now the bishop, I think, is a really good was an elephant. A really good indicator of the power of the church. I love this. Well, I'm a gamer. I'm a I'm yeah. a I'm a gamer, and what does that mean? It means I play all kinds of games. I'm a, I, I'm by by trade, I, I work as a game developer, mm -hmm. and I'm I play all kinds of games. Uh, board games, video games, all kinds of stuff. And there's a lot of parallels to baseball. Uh, and, and a lot of these games, you see things happen way faster because the lifespan of a video game is, is like at best five, six years. Um, and baseball's been around for 100 times that long. But there's a lot of similarities, and I'll, I'll try to explain it. These games get changed. As long as they're there, there will be rule changes. There will be additions. And people like them or they don't like them. Mm -hmm. And you can't really stop it because the people who control these games want to justify their job. They want to they put their stamp on it. Yeah. They want to they make it their own in a small way. Or they want to fix something that's legit kind of broken in the game. Like something is, they needs to be rebalanced. Mm -hmm. You know, this type of item is more powerful than this other item. We need to level the playing field here. And I see this play, I've seen it play out hundreds of times. Okay. Well, let's say dozens of times. Yeah. Uh, where you see a game birth and people love it um, or they don't. And then it doesn't have a life, but the ones that they do love, then it grows and it changes and it, it gets added onto. And, if there's an active user base, the game will get changed. And almost always, at some point, there's a player revolt or there's a, a fan revolt. Let's yeah, call yeah. it a fan revolt because that's what we're talking about with right. baseball. And the game dies and people go find another game. Uh -huh. Now, there is one very notable exception that I want to get to about this. World of Warcraft. Mm-hmm. Heard of it, don't know anything about World it. World of Warcraft is one of the most popular games of all time, without a doubt, and has been going for dozens of years now. How do most people play it? Is it a computer game? It's on game? the computer. It's a computer game. Okay. Video game. But what happened with this game was they got to a point where they decided to release, re-release the original version of the game. Okay. And it was super popular.
because it's similar to how I did it the first time, but it's definitely different. 